So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on the use of AI in scientific publishing, which is a very hot topic at the moment. So I'm sure we'll have a very interesting session today. My name is Eduardo Queiroz Alves. I'm EGU's editorial manager. And our speaker today is Dr. Sam Ealingworth, who is an associate professor at Edinburgh Napier University, where his research involves using poetry, games, and generative AI to help develop dialogues between scientists and non-scientists and to improve staff and student belonging in higher education. Um, Sam is also executive editor of Geoscience Communication, which is one of um, the EGU journals. Um, so before I hand over to Sam, I just want to remind you to follow our code of conduct. We will send the link in the chat. I also want to remind you that this session is being recorded and will be made available on EGU's YouTube channel in about a week's time. Uh, please send your questions using the Q&A box and we will make sure to answer at least some of them after the presentation. So um, welcome some, um, and uh, I would like to invite you to give your presentation. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for that invitation and thanks everyone um, for coming along today. So as Eduardo pointed out, please do feel free to put your questions into the question and answer function and we'll pick them up at the end. I'm probably gonna speak for about 30 minutes, something like that. And I wanna make sure there's lots of times for questions and answers as this is a hot topic, but it's also rapidly evolving as well. Just to say as well, if anyone wants to follow up with me, my email address is on the slide. So just to start with, Eduardo gave me a very nice introduction there, but a little bit about my own positionality, just in terms of where I sit, in terms of commenting on this. So I'm an associate professor at Edinburgh Napier University. Um, my work and research involves using poetry and games and also generative AI as a way of developing dialogues between different communities, scientists and non-scientists, and then also at a more meta level in terms of staff and student belonging within higher education institutes. I'm also the chief executive editor um, of Geoscience Communication, which is one of the EGU journals. And I am also the founder and editor-in-chief of Consilience, which is the world's first science and um, poetry journal. So I've got a lot of experience in terms of editorial and also scientific and creative thought and I'm obviously involved with EGU as well. So this webinar really is an introduction to some of the challenges, opportunities and developments of AI both on scientific publishing and communications more generally. It's quite a lot of text but hopefully I'll be able to present it in an engaging way. And like I say, it's there's a lot of space at the end for questions because it is a rapidly evolving field. Hopefully by the end of this webinar, you've got a better idea as to the challenges and opportunities that AI presents to science and scientific publishing and science communication and also a little bit of a better understanding in terms of EGU's official stance on this. I've got some links in there that we'll also share in the chat. So I just wanna start off by talking about impact on scientific process and governance. So one of the biggest things we need to worry about is plagiarism. So as I've written there, there's a heightened risk of plagiarism with AI's ability to synthesize and rephrase existing content, necessitating advanced plagiarism detection, and attribution, verification, and scientific communications. What do I mean by this? Well, we all know that whenever we submit our work um, to a journal, or even when we're doing science in the first place, we shouldn't plagiarize. Um, we should cite and we should reference and we should build on the work of others, but we should do so in a, a voice that is original and that is ours. Now, from a scientific publishing point of view, when we come to look at um, work that is submitted to a journal, we, we tend to get a similarity report that tells us the likelihood that something has been plagiarised. Um, obviously, there's a degree of um, interpretation in that. Now, one of the issues that we have 
with generative AI, such as ChatGPT, such as um, Claude, et cetera, is that we can't always tell. Now, with written words, it's sometimes a little bit easier to tell when something's been plagiarized or not, but with creating especially images or figures, sometimes it's very difficult, stroke impossible, to tell where generative AI has used somebody's work without giving it appropriate credit. So basically we need to be very, very careful with understanding, I'll come on to this in a little bit, how these models are using work and the extent to which we can map, account for or allow plagiarism to take place. Second thing we need to consider, and this is again in terms of broad scientific process and governance, is that there's implicit bias. So AI systems may harbor implicit biases from training data, which can skew the representation of research findings and influence citation practices in scholarly publications. What do I mean by this? Well, a lot of generative AI is written and developed by a not entirely diverse group of people, predominantly in the West, and a lot of generative AI is trained on the internet, which again is predominantly in the West and tends to be very biased towards certain communities, which isn't and which aren't diverse and representative of global narratives. So if, which is what we're trying to be doing in the geosciences, if we're interested in diversifying um, science and scientific research. One of the ways that we can do this is to make sure that we're looking to authors that come from all over the globe, not just the global south and not just specific countries, but that are truly diverse. However, one of the problems with many of the large language models that make up generative AI is that they have biases in their training data, many of which are slightly opaque that means that some of these biases come through. So we need to be very, very careful when we're using these models that they don't continue to propagate a lack of diversity that has stymied and stifled scientific development in recent years. There needs to be a governance in data sharing. So as I've written here, the role of AI in scientific publishing calls for robust governance frameworks to ensure the responsibility, sharing and use of data. So these just don't exist at the moment. So we need to better understand how we can share data, how data is being used, how data is being used by these models, but how data is being used by us as scientists as well. To what extent should or shouldn't we be uploading other people's research into large language models, for example? Many of us use um, things like ChatGPT or ChatPDF as ways of getting summaries of research, but to what extent is that actually using data and sharing data for which there is no governance? So this is again, something that we need to really think about. And really importantly, a demand for transparent AI models. So at the moment, most, if not all, of the large language models and generative AI that people use are opaque, they're black boxes. We don't really know what goes into them. We don't really know how they're used. So what we need to do is, in my opinion, and many others, we need to work with a lot of these tech companies to better understand exactly how they're created so that there's clear transparency and accountability as well. And then building on that ethical standards for AI use. Again, there's been a little bit of work in research in this, but there needs to be much clearer frameworks for ethical guidelines for AI in scientific communication, scientific publishing, and science more generally. We're not talking about legislation that is you know, overtly um, punishing or tells people they have to do certain things, but rather thinking about flexible frameworks that really think about how we can use AI in a way that is ethical and maybe also effective as well. So these are general impacts on scientific processes and governance that generative AI and large language models are having and that we need to think about. But what about the impact that they're having on practice. So in terms of the positive impacts, because it's really important that we don't get caught up in the hyperbole of AI is going to remove all jobs and destroy the world order. It's just not going to work like that. 
And there's many, many positive impacts that it can have. So one of them is enhanced language editing. So as I've written here, AI can assist in refining the language of scientific manuscripts, making them more comprehensible and helping non-native English speakers to communicate their research more effectively. So not only can we make, as, as native English speakers, can we use AI to make our manuscripts and work more accessible to non-native English speakers. We can also, if we are non-native English speakers, we can use generative AI to help us in that process as well. And this is something that's really beneficial, not just for the authors and the readers, but also for the editors and the reviewers and the publishers as well. Um, again, for many reasons which we might not agree with, English tends to be the lingua franca of the scientific world. And for people that don't have access to language um, training or people that are able to provide that copywriting facility, which can be sometimes quite expensive. AI is potentially a very, very inclusive way of accessing that. Improved accessibility. So AI technologies can make scientific content more accessible to a broader audience, including those with disabilities. One of the ways it can do this is by providing automated summarization and easy to understand explanations. Um, it can also really help to frame um, research in a way that's maybe more understood by different audiences and different publics. So one thing you might want to do that's really interesting is working with, let's say, ChatGPT, giving it the abstract for a research paper and asking them to um, summarise this work for a specific audience. For example, please, could you write this to communicate it to a group of policymakers in Thailand, or please could you write it to communicate it to a group of five-year-olds in Lagos? It's a really great way of being able to do that, um, cost-effective and also accessible. Support for early career scientists. I think it's really, really helpful here. So thinking about my own experiences, sadly a long time ago now, as an early career scientist, it can be overwhelming when you, first publishing a manuscript, like what do I need to do? What's the processes? How do I write a letter to an editor? All of these things, it can actually really help us with the logistics of that process. Now, I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I'm very, very categorically saying that we should not be using generative AI to write our research papers. But what we can do is we, it, we can use it to help us with some of those additional tasks. So for example, thinking about um, spell checking, thinking about grammar checking, thinking about drafting a letter to an editor, thinking about, you know, even just asking it on a personal level. I use ChatGPT a lot to ask questions and to interrogate it in terms of what does publishing landscape look like? What kind of steps might I expect in, in this journey? So it's a really good way to help to provide support for early career scientists. And then for a publisher, it can also help to streamline some publishing logistics. So again, we would never want to do this just automatically with no checks, but sometimes it can do, it can help about tracking, formatting, compliance checks as well, potentially leading to a more efficient publication process. What about negative impacts though? Well, proliferation of misinformation. So AI could inadvertently facilitate the spread of misinformation if the algorithms generating or creating content are not checked for accuracy. We're seeing this already quite substantially. I mean, we can look at the, um, really need to look at what's happening with some of the misuse of AI with regards to the elections that happen in the United States this year. There's a real danger that AI is being used for certain platforms to misrepresent science. We can see it being used by some climate change diets. We can see it being used by some anti-vaxxers. And it's really important that we think about how AI is being used. And again, for us as scientists and us as researchers, yes, use AI, but don't just take it as read. I mean, it's a tool, whatever it creates and whatever it presents, we should be using our critical skill, thinking skills and our skills as scientists to interrogate that and not just automatically take it as face value. Copyright and plagiarism issue. So I touched on this earlier. It's really difficult from not just an ethical standpoint, but from a legal standpoint as well, especially with the creation of figures and more creative elements as well, to understand exactly what has been plagiarized and what hasn't been plagiarized as well. 
um, in terms of paraphrasing, in terms of use. It's really important that we think about the limitations of AI. And again, that we don't just automatically go to it, but rather understand and try to break down as I come to a bit more, what those models look like and how they're using the data. Skill erosion among scientists. So I think this is really important. I touched on earlier, one of the benefits is that it can help early career scientists. But if we're only using AI to do everything, then we actually are unlearning or maybe not learning how to do some of the skills themselves. So for example, we could use AI to do a systematic literature review for us, but actually doing a systematic literature review uses an incredible amount of useful skills and helps us to develop those skills in the process. So again, it's about using AI, I think, as um, a tool without using it as a way of replacing everything that we've got as well. So we need to very carefully think about that as well um, in terms of skill erosion when scientists use it, but don't use it at the replacement of everything else. Lack of transparency in AI decision making. Again, talked about this, but the black box nature of some, if not most, AI systems can obscure the rational behind decisions, eroding trust in scientific findings. So, as well as the fact that we don't really know what's going on and the fact that it can proliferate those uh, misconceptions and also those biases, there's a danger that if if we overly use AI for our research and then people are like, well, can we trust that? Like, what is that, what is that bot or that large language model actually doing? So again, there's a framing, there's an optics issue there that we need to be aware of. And then bias in, in scientific narratives. I mean, I've put it quite plainly there that if AI is trained on data reflecting white male Western perspectives, I say this as a white Western man, could it actually reinforce these biases in scientific publishing, marginalizing other groups and perspectives? Lots of us spend a lot of time trying to help diversify the geosciences and to platform the voices of other marginalized communities, but actually is AI compatible with that? And if not, then what can we do to make it so? So where are the gaps and potential risks for AI on scientific publishing and communications? An absence of an ethics framework. So there really isn't a comprehensive ethics framework for AI applications. And it's something that we need to develop both in terms of scientific publishing and communication, but also just science more generally. Again, though, I think as well as being potential risks, these are potential opportunities. I think the opportunity to create a framework is a large piece of work, but it would really help us to better understand what those processes are and to make links between different communities as well intellectual property and copyright conflict. So AI's role in generating and disseminating con um, content raises complex issues, less so with the text and much more so I think in terms of images and, um, and figures and building on people's work without giving it fair attribution. Again, with text, it can be maybe that AI is paraphrasing people's work without um, giving it credit, which is again, something that we need to be very careful of. Widening the digital divide. So this is something that I don't think is talked about enough. So the digital divide is this idea that some people have access to high-speed internet, lots of software, lots of hardware, and other people don't. And those people to some extent or to a large extent are a huge disadvantage. And we saw this exasperated um, largely in the COVID climate. Um, so where we see, for example, people working from home, people being schooled at home in the UK, at least there was a huge issue with um, many school children um, from more impoverished areas were like having one laptop between five or six members of the family, which was very, very difficult for getting any work done. And we know that with a lot of these large language models and generative AI tools, there's a paid version and then there's a free version. But more than that, you there's a high speed internet, there's not having high speed internet, there's access to the latest software, there's not having access to the latest software. And so we need to make sure that we don't exasperate this digital divide and that we also enable those people who don't have access to the premium paid models or the high speed internet not to be left behind. And that rather than widen them, we choose to close that digital divide. And then 
what I call the Skynet effect. So there's so much hyperbole in in the mass media around, you know, the Skynet from 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 the Terminator series that there's going to be this generative AI is going to create this singularity and this AI that's going to lead to a dystopian control over humanity. It's not, or certainly not in the foreseeable future. But what it genuinely might do is, as I've said, stifle efforts to promote diversity in scientific communication and scientific publishing and science more general by reinforcing existing biases. And whatever you read about generative AI in, in the mass media and social media, whatever, I think those two last points that I've talked about, the digital divide and the diversification of science are things that don't really get enough talk time. And these are the issues that we need to think about and that are going to proliferate beyond scientific publishing if we're not careful about it. So where do we need to engage as scientists, as researchers, and as authors, reviewers, editors, publishers of scientific manuscripts? Well, embedding ethics in publication. So we need to think about integrating ethical considerations into the core of scientific publishing, ensuring that AI applications align with the principles of responsible research and communication. So, you know, as I'll talk about in a second, EGU's has got its own framework, but we also need to think about what does this look like? There's some interesting studies going on at the moment, but I think we need more work here. Um, and again, we need to think about beyond our own positionality, beyond our own privileges, thinking about the whole of the wider uh, global scientific picture. Co-creation of transparent platforms. So I think we could embrace the transparent publishing movement spirit to co-create robust transparent platforms with AI, facilitating equitable knowledge sharing. So this isn't talking about making our own from scratch, but rather working with technology providers. So actively engaging with tech companies like OpenAI, like Google, like Anthropic, um, like Microsoft, to co-develop AI tools tailored for scientific communication, ensuring that they are fit for purpose. And I know that there's some great examples out there already of open and free and ethical um, AI platforms, but they should all be like that. And a lot of them should be far more transparent. And in making those connections and in engaging with um, various tech companies we also need to hold them to account we sadly need to only look at social media to see what can happen when we don't hold these tech companies to account um, and there are many opportunities here but there's also huge opportunities for profit that unfortunately a lot of people see so what we need to do as scientists is we need to hold these companies to account make sure that they contribute positively to the scientific community, that they're not um, responsible for spreading misinformation, that they're not responsible for widening the digital divide, that they're not responsible for reducing diversity, that they're not responsible for reducing the quality of our scientific impact. So yes, we need to engage these technology providers, but we don't need, we shouldn't be doing it as a begging bowl. We should be doing it as a way that we use our position as researchers, as world leaders in science, to put pressure on these organizations to make sure that they are doing things in an ethical and diverse and inclusive and above all, transparent and scientifically rigorous process. And innovate continuity. We need to move beyond this business as usual point of view. Look, generative ai is is here now it's a reality it's really cool it can make our lives much easier it can make our science much more interesting we need to be careful of that we need to think about what the limitations are but why would we continue pretending that it's not there we need to foster a culture of innovation in scientific publishing that embraces the transformative potential of ai rather than present pre pretending it doesn't exist it's like pretending the internet doesn't exist it's there now it it has been there for quite a while and a large proportion of the world engage with it so why are we not doing more to do that so i've put together i think three initial recommendations for 
publishers, um, for editors, for for all, and above all for authors and scientists. And and this is very much in keeping with EGU's um, publishing um, framework and guidance that I'll share in a second. One, do not allow AI tools as co-authors. Do you remember about a year ago, like a couple of papers in quite prestigious outlets were having AI tools as co-authors. It's just, it doesn't make sense. It's just a bit silly. Um, we should ask all authors to outline clearly how they've used AI in their research and write up. Now, I don't think we should necessarily just ban the use of AI. It doesn't really make sense. We can especially, and again, we can use AI to improve our language. We can use AI to help paraphrase, uh, paraphrase ourselves. We can use AI to do some of the more mundane tasks to help us, for example, draft letters to editors to, you know, when you're reading some of your work and you go, do you know what? That's not quite as tight or not quite as engaging or not quite as effective as it could be. Please can you paraphrase it or rewrite it in this way? I think that's fine, but we need to, make sure that as publishers we're asking our authors how they're using ai um, and we give them that opportunity so that we're not punishing them but we're having that open dialogue and treating the scientists as adults which they are and then i think have a link to evolving policy and for me i think what we what we try to do with eg publications and which i think is a good rule of thumb is that there's a difference between using AI to improve content, which is generally acceptable, versus using AI to generate content, which is generally not acceptable. So I think that as a broad rule of thumb is quite good. And again, in addition to that, not just accepting as fact whatever AI produces, but rather questioning it, interrogating it, using it as another data source that we would with anything else. Look, as scientists, we're very good at asking questions. We're very good at being critical, like in a positive way, and you know, not taking things at face value. And actually, in us doing that, it encourages others to do the same and actually to treat AI as this great opportunity to develop people's critical thinking skills and, and, and questioning of the world as well. So, broad recommendation: don't allow AI as co-authors. Provide a space for authors to be honest about how they've used AI. And then maybe develop policy that enables AI to be used to improve content, but not to create it. So here are the EG and Copernicus guidelines, which um, Simon's very kindly shared in the chat. You can scan that QR code as well. But basically the obligations for authors are no fictitious names or AI tools are allowed to be listed as authors or co-authors. It's very sensible. Obligation for referees. Referee comments and reports should always be written by persons since they are accountable and responsible for the content they submit. It is not allowed to use AI tools to generate referee comments or reports. And I think this is fair enough, right? Because you're, as a referee, you have quite a large um, privilege in that you're reading someone else's work that could have taken months, if not years, to create. And using AI to make judgments on that is just not on. It's not cool and it's just not polite so please don't do it and then manuscript submission with egu and copernicus journals we have i think a really open way of doing this authors have to declare that i am aware that if i used ai tools to generate part of my manuscript i should describe the usage in either the method section or the acknowledgements so recently i used um chat gpt to create a figure for a paper, I asked it to do a stylized version of the electromagnetic spectrum for a paper I was submitting to uh, geoscience communication. And so I had that in the acknowledgements and in the figure, and I had to tick that box when I was in the manuscript submission as well. So they're the policies that we've got in place at EGU and Copernicus at the moment. I would say this, of course, but I think that they're very balanced, they're very fair, Happy to have a discussion with people in the Q&A as well about what they might think. And then as I wrap towards the end of my, my speaking bit, I just want to show you this because I think it's hilarious. Um, and this is what we want to avoid. So people might have seen on Twitter about 10 days ago, there was quite a large discussion around this paper. So this is um, a paper called Cellular Functions of Spermatological 
I'm sorry, sperm otogenial stem cells in relation to Jack stat signal and pathway. Um, if you Google that, you will see another image come up that was created by Generative AI that is maybe not suitable for a lunchtime uh, webinar, which involves the use of, uh, <laughs> it involves a certain part of a rodent's anatomy, shall we say. But look at this image on the screen. This is an image that was submitted and accepted in a paper as acceptable. It's junk. But anyone who spent any time using generative AI um, to generate images will know it often presents stuff like this and it really struggles with, with, with using text. What does this mean? It doesn't mean anything. And I think that this reflects incredibly badly on the authors, on the reviewers, on the editor, but also on the journal. I mean, I think allowing something like this through is, is pretty bad. They have gone on to retract it as well, but Again, it's just that thing of don't take everything at face value. Don't assume that it's going to be able to generate something better than you. And again, be very careful, especially with images, as we're not entirely sure where it is or where it isn't uh, plagiarizing as well. Um, just a reminder that for those people who will be joining us for the EGU General Assembly, either online or virtually, we have an EGU great debate around this, which is entitled Artificial Intelligence in Scientific Publishing, Blessing or Bane. Uh, this is convened by our, the head of the Publications Committee, Barbara Evans, and also uh, by Eduardo. Uh, you can scan there to see the session, and I would really strongly encourage people to go along because it is a hot topic and an evolving one as well. Um, so there are a few references that I've used to put together this um, presentation because you know it is an evolving field and there's my contact details as well I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that you can see my face um, and Eduardo's back as well and I'm happy to take any questions I'll pick them up um, in the question and answer session I don't know if Eduardo wanted to say anything and then I can start answering those um, yeah, I just want to thank you very much for your very interesting presentation, Sam. I think it's good to hear about the, both the positive and the negative aspects of using AI in scientific publishing. And yeah, we have a few questions in the Q&A box. So if you want to um, have a look. Yeah, I'll start answering those, of course. Thank you, Eduardo. And please feel free to ask, continue answering uh, or putting your questions into the question and answer session and I'll answer them as we get to them. So someone's written here, um, can or should AI be used for creative products like poems, songs, and images and codes? If yes, how should it be acknowledged? So I think this is a really, really difficult question. So with my other hat on as a poet and as an editor of a poetry journal, we tend not to, um, again, we have quite an open policy of let us know how we've used AI in the process, but it's very, very difficult because I think with something, especially with images, as I touched on in the talk, it's very hard to tell how generative AI might have used images. So it might have used an element of somebody's work that wasn't, it didn't have a Creative Commons license. It might have used an element of somebody's work that was explicitly not to be used in that way. Artists obviously rely upon a lot of those permissions for their, for their um, livelihoods. So, I don't think there's a straight yes or no answer. I think that transparency in models gets around a lot of this, but I think what, however you're doing it, if you're running your own publishing house or if you're running your own poetry journal, have a conversation with your authors and with your editorial team to see what you feel most comfortable with. Have a conversation with your um, the people that are likely to be publishing with you. If you are somebody that's publishing and who is a creative, then have a word with the people of the journal that you're wanting to publish with just to see what their policy with. I don't think there is a right or wrong answer, but I think I always just think about how would you feel the other way? Like how would you feel if somebody used your work without credit in it, or there was a potential that it was used in some way without it being credited? Would that be okay? Does that, is that okay with your particular practices? And if you have acknowledged it, if you have used it, just acknowledge it in a way that says I've used gen with anything, I think just be honest. I have used generative AI to find 
a simile for this particular poem. So I I use I use generative AI in part of my poetic creative process. I use it like for example to create kennings, which I'm not the greatest at doing, or for example to come up with a rhyming word or a way of paraphrasing something. Often what I'll do is I'll ask ChatGPT to critique one of my poems. Or to say, like, what do you think this poem is about? Which is quite a good way of getting to the bottom of it as well. So I'm not saying yes. Like I'm not saying absolutely no. But just have a word with the people that are involved in that process and, and try to make it more open as well. So I believe we've answered that question. The next one is, how can one engage with technology providers? Can you suggest some platforms for that? This is such a difficult question. So... Obviously, you can like cold call or cold email technology providers, which I tend to do. Um, they'll rarely get back to you. The other thing is to publish in this space and to say, look, this is some work that we think uh, needs to be done. We would like to be engaged with people in this way. And then you're presenting opportunities for frameworks uh, and to work with them. You could work with your universities or your higher education institutes um, policy team you could work with colleagues who have links to policy you could get in contact with local policy makers or national policy makers as a way in or just contact somebody in the research team as well if there's technology providers saying look um, I'm working in this particular space I'm really interested in finding out more about how your models work and I believe I have something to contribute so not just reaching out to them and saying look you're wrong because they're not but just saying these are where some of your limitations might be and i think that i have potentially some answers for this is this something you've considered so offering them a potential solution and an offer of help as well as pointing out a problem as well um the next question is thank you for your nice presentation i'll acknowledge that thank you very much thank you for your nice question um fuavos uh, apologies if i'm mispronouncing people's names it's the first time i've seen them written down if we use chat GPT for correcting the English in the text that we've already produced, should we declare this? I think so. I think we can say that in the acknowledgements. In the acknowledgements, we can just say uh, chat GPT or generative AI was used in this manuscript for um, typesetting or for corrections. And again, I would just put that in and certainly thinking about the Copernicus um, publication system when you're submitting your work you have that little letter to the editor or note to the reviewer you can put just something in there as well just saying i have used this particular large language model or generative ai for doing this particular task but i think in that instance it's absolutely fine and wouldn't be a problem in the slightest so i've answered that question so antareep says being new to the field of research and having experience with AI tools, I've encountered instances where misinformation is produced by IA, AI echoing your observations. What strategies would you suggest for ensuring the accuracy of our results? Or what steps can we take to validate the accuracy of our analysis? Really good question. So I think the key thing is that we can, we should, I would never use a large language model or generative AI to analyze data for me, like especially quantitative data. I might use it to compare what I've already got, or I might use it as a starting point, um, mainly because I just don't know how it's doing that analysis. Um, for people who are more talented at coding than myself, you might want to develop your own generative AI algorithm like you can do that through through some of the existing large language models and train it using your own data set and you know what's going into it but I think there's always that element of a black box I mean there's elements of black boxes in a lots of scientific research so I think it's whatever you feel most comfortable in but also bear in mind that you're going to have to report that in your work and as well as the fact that you want it to stand up to the reviewers and the editors you want it to stand up to the wider publics who are reading your work as well so that they can have confidence that the work that you've done has um, reliability and validity can be repeated and has accountability as well so my suggestion there would be to just make sure that if you are using AI that you can calibrate it that you can validate it and that again you don't just take everything at face value but rather you um, interrogate what those results are as well so next question here, which is from uh, Jerowin, which says, thank you for sharing your view on AI. How can we increase the change that research papers are picked up 
by our AI being on the right side of bias. So how can we increase the chance that research papers are picked up by AI? That's a really good question. So I would say in terms of just general strategic communication, it's probably about optimizing search engine optimization there. So when you're submitting your work, think about what the abstract is, think about what the keywords are, think about what the plain language summary is. Think about how you can share that work more widely anyway. I mean, this is just all good practice anyway. So, you know, are, are you putting about it on X or Twitter? Are you posting about it on LinkedIn? Have you shared it on Reddit? Have you shared it with the EGU blog network? Have you shared it with your own blog networks? Are you talking on podcasts about it? Have you done a press release about it? You should be doing this for all of your scientific publications anyway. Have you put it on your email signature so that, when people even away from AI are searching, they find that. I mean, depending on how what model you're using and how you've trained it, like if you're using ChatGPT uh, version four and you're asking it to search the web as part of that process, then it'll be using, it'll be beholden to the same search engine optimization as anybody would be. So thinking about how to make your research more visible more generally by talking about those things I've talked about um, is a way that you will able enable it to get more visible through AI as well. And again, just, I guess, increasing your platform and increasing um, your visibility in that digital space. Um, so we've answered that one. And then the last question from Barbara, thanks Barbara. How do you see the future of publishing? Since it might become easier and faster to write papers, will we be flooded by submissions? And what can we as editors and reviewers, but also publishers do to ensure scientific quality and credibility in publications? Excellent question. So I think even before AI, we can see that the extent to which um, submissions and publications has just been exponential in the past century, decade, five years even. I think that's only going to increase. I think that there's a danger that many people, there could be a dangerous vicious cycle in that many people who are okay we're, we're in a system sadly in research where we have publish or perish where to some extent our personal careers are tied up with the amount of research that we publish the amount of which is cited etc so you could see a vicious cycle in which unscrupulous researchers decided to use ai to create a paper and then that was picked up by a um a not very good <laughs> or ethically unsound publishing house, not EGU or Copernicus, but those that we know are blacklisted, for example, and then publishing it, and then they've got an output. So I think that one of our roles as editors and reviewers and ethically sound publishers is to have these conversations, to be open, to be transparent, but above all, to be scientifically rigorous. And so I don't think we should necessarily automate, um, turn it in and others say that they've got automated models that work for finding the use of AI, but then I've used them, they're not particularly great. I think myself, when I, I've used AI so much now and being presented with so many students' work and other people's work that have used it, for me, it's quite obvious there's certain tells when AI is used, certain words in English language, for example, delve, dive, realm, they are all words that crop up quite a lot in the use of generative AI. Certain phrases, certain endeavor is another one that comes up quite a lot. Or again, if suddenly they're using English spelling, then it goes to American spelling. So there's tells, but I think that the future of publishing is the future how it's always been. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of um, constraints. There's going to be a lot of people wanting to publish. This is make, it's going to make it harder, but we just need to have open and honest conversations with our authors, explain to them that in many instances, there's an element of AI use that's okay, like improving the content of our work, but that in every single instance, everything should be rigorous and valid and shouldn't be taken at face value and that actually what we'll find is that people will be driven to want to publish with those journals because journals like ours and journals that have those rigor but also that transparency and that openness as well so it's not about shutting the gate 
And it's not about opening the gate completely. It's instead about having a dialogue around what that gate might look like. Um, and then another question now, is there an underlying implicit criticism when using AI? Could openly admitting to using AI lead to a perceived reduction in the overall scientific capabilities and skill sets for authors? That is a really good question. Um, I think it comes down to trust. Um, so I think having a conversation with your colleagues as well, like, look, we're, right, we're co-writing this paper together. I've actually used AI on this little bit here, or there's just an assumption that we're going to use AI is, is fine. I don't think people should be penalized for using AI, provided that they've done it in a way that is ethical, in a way that is transparent, and in a way that gives credit to other people as well. But I don't think at all there should be an implicit criticism because there's a danger there as well, you know, in terms of those um, white Western narratives again. Like it's very easy for me as an English speaking um, white male to say, don't ever use AI even for spell checking purposes because I might not need to use it as much as somebody else. So I think it's a think about the, that broader positionality, that broader space and how we can use generative AI um, and large language models to actually diversify the publication process rather than um, making it, um, rather than narrowing that digital divide and making it more exclusive and exclusionary as well. So there shouldn't be an implicit criticism, but I think, it, again, it's, it's just about having those open dialogues, those conversations, and hopefully creating a space where we can do that. And I think that the EGU journals and Copernicus is a great place to do that. At a meta level as well, I think many journals, my own included, Geoscience Communication, would welcome studies that looked at the use of generative AI. So, for example, a very interesting topic I would love to see a paper on is the extent to which generative AI can propagate misinformation in the geosciences or the role of generative AI in combating against the climate crisis or the role of generative AI in the future of academic publishing. These are empirical studies that I would love to see published in our, in our journals and I'm sure um, Barbara and many others would as well. So I think that's all of uh, the questions that are answered. Just gonna check Edward, if there's any other questions that have come up or that need answering. I actually have a question because um, I think we have a lot of early career scientists in our audience today. So I was wondering um, what resources can be provided to educate the new generations of researchers in the, in the use of AI in publications? That's a great question, Eduardo. And I guess a challenge as well that I can offer to everyone because I know that Barbara and others are on the call as well that maybe we could run um, a couple of short courses on this in future general, general assemblies, or we could have a, a wider uh, Copernicus science communication, like um, summer school stroke um, training course on it, because there's so many opportunities here. And like, I really want people to use, gen I use generative AI on an hourly basis. Like I find it incredibly helpful, mainly for drafting emails that like, it means that I can use my brain for something else. So I think that what we should be doing as a publishing house and as a organization is to be offering workshops and training sessions for early career scientists and listening to them as well. So I don't want to create work for Eduardo, but early career scientists that are on this call, please feel free to reach out to Eduardo or Simon or myself and let us know what would be useful for you. Uh, and we can try and put something together in terms of what that might look like. But Eduardo, I think we could definitely put together like a short course on the kind of tools that people can use and how they might want to use it in manuscript preparation and development. We could get a couple of editors involved from the publications committee as well. Uh, and again, that's all about having those dialogues and moving away from that implicit negative there as well. Um, question here from Denis. Hi, Denis. Um, who's, thanks for my presentation. Thank you, Denis. Great question. And don't you think that genetic will just enhance current scientific misbehavior? <laughs> this is a very, very politely way word of putting it. I think it could, Denis. Um, I think that there's always going to be rogues and people in the scientific community and outside of the scientific community that don't abide by the same 
standards and ethical principles that many of us have built our careers around. But I think it's really important that we don't bury our head in the sand because otherwise what will happen is that generative AI will be used by other people and not by us. And it can be a great tool for good and it can be a tool to really help us. And eventually, once we better understand what these models are and we're involved in the co-creation and development of them, we probably can use them for analysis with a greater degree of understanding and compatibility and, um, and trust. So I think that it could enhance current scientific misbehaviors if left unchecked, but part of that unchecknedness is when we don't talk about it. So we need to have these dialogues, we need to have these conversations, and especially if anybody's listening who's, who are from these um, tech companies as well, we welcome the opportunity to talk to you, to, to co-create those spaces as well. But certainly an action for Eduardo, Simon and myself, I guess, going forward is to think about maybe, hopefully people have found this webinar useful as a slightly one-way exchange of information, um, but we can certainly look at putting together um, some opportunities for how we might provide early career scientists with opportunities for using generative AI to help develop their research skills going forward as well. Actually, this makes me think of, uh, so EGU offers peer review training, as you know, and definitely this is a topic that we should also discuss in our next uh, peer review training. So the use of AI in peer review, probably. Exactly. So for one thing that people might want to think about, and I'm, I'm saying this is a personal opinion rather than in any way endorsed opinion at all, is even though we, we don't want, we don't want, you don't want to give the paper to AI and say peer review this, that's not good. But what you might want to do is you might want to peer review it yourself, make a list of bullet points, but you might not necessarily be good at feeding that back in a, in a constructive and critical way that that can be really difficult when you're doing peer review for the first time. So you might instead want to give a prompt to gen generative AI. And again, effective prompt writing is something we can develop a skill set to say, imagine that you are a in very um, collaborative and um, helpful and constructive reviewer. Please, can you take these bullet points and turn it into a review that is coherent, that is encouraging and that is engaging? And I think that would be a really effective way of using it and would especially help those people who are new to peer review or where English might not be their first language as well. And sometimes that nuance can be lost. So I think that would be something we could definitely do for peer reviewers. So it goes back again to, to that thing you mentioned in your presentation, the difference between using AI to generate content and actually structuring your ideas in a very um, engaging way. and, and Exactly. Um, and response to reviewers as well, you know, yeah. like thinking about these are the points that I want to make, but sometimes getting that tone, especially when you're not a native speaker, can be very difficult between, you know, rolling over and being aggressively defensive. And I struggle with that as a native speaker. And I think that generative AI is a way that can just help with that. But again, what we should not be doing is just giving it the paper and saying, please write the reviewer comments or please do the review, as I don't think it's respectful or helpful in that way at all. Okay. Um, I have another question because you mentioned the erosion of the skills of, of scientists when they use AI in a not so responsible way. So um, I was going to ask you, how can we define acceptable limits uh, mm. for the use of AI in publications without compromising originality and ind independent thought? Yeah, I think I think that's more a more broad thing with science more generally, right? It's just like you wouldn't, you know, thinking about doing your PhD, like when you do your PhD, you, you have to you do your literature review. There's a lot of there's a lot of failure, but there's a lot of trial by error. Um, and there's an eventual success as well. And we don't want to remove that process. I'm not saying that we have to make things hard for sake sake, but what we should, you, you can't learn how to do something by just putting it into a model. You have to understand how it works. So I don't think that we necessarily need to say there's a limit, but rather we need to explain it. And if it helps, a rule of thumb that I have when I'm using generative AI is I will never use it to do something that I couldn't do. So I will use it to write, maybe like to modify something or even to give me a, a paragraph on a topic or turn bullet points. But I know I could do that. So I'm then able to sense check it and look into it and to interrogate it as well. And so that's a rule of thumb that I have that we might want to offer to other people as well going forward. But I think that's, that, that's, a, that's a good, I guess okay. a good rule of thumb to have. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I think we're running out of time now. So perhaps one last question. Um, so several publishers have issued their own guidelines on the use of AI in publications, and they do have some similarities, but they also differ in some aspects. Uh, do you think it would be better to have a single set of guidelines? No, because it's a really good question. I think every every publishing house is different, and they have different they have different epistemologies. I guess they have different like ideologies, and they also have different logis logistical requirements as well. So I think as long as there's clear and transparent guidelines, that's fine. And then what's cool about that is that you as a researcher can then look at those publishers. And just as I would think, I want to only publish in open access journals. So I'm only going to publish in open access journals. And some journals don't have that, fine. I might say as a researcher, I only want to publish in a journal that has this particular attitude towards generative AI. So again, offering that choice, but being upfront about it is great. And I, I just think that as long as there's a, a clear policy, mm -hmm. they're going to be different because different publishing houses are different by that respect. That's okay. a great question, Eduardo. Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, are there any further questions? Um, I think that's all of it. And I think we're, we're almost on the hour, so good timing as well. Okay, yeah, so yeah, time's up now. So thank you very much, Sam, uh, for presenting to us today. And thank you everyone online for attending and participating. Yeah, thank you and goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.